Hey, Bridgetown Church. Thanks for joining online with us. We really wish we could be in person with you. I want to start off by reading a passage out of John 14. It says, If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, but because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Lord, and you love us. Lord, have you gone before us? Lord, and made our path straight. We honor you and love you right now. Amen. At this time, if you're with friends or with family, greet them, say hi. If you're not with anyone, pull out your phone and give a text and connect with someone and then put your phone away. Hey everybody, Gerald here. Just wanna say welcome again. Thank you for gathering with us online today. It is our goal here at Bridgetown Church to practice the way of Jesus together in Portland. And I just wanna say wherever you're at today, at learning about who Jesus is and following the way of Jesus, you're welcome here. And we're really, really glad that you're here. This is our moment for generosity for those of us who are part of the Bridgetown family. And we have been um, reading this liturgy together around giving and generosity, taken mainly out of New Testament scriptures. And I just wanna invite you to, as I read this, would you read it with me out loud? I don't know about you, but the more I read this and even put it to memory, it is doing deep work in my heart and I'm coming to really love it. So would you out loud read this with me? Godliness with contentment is great gain. We bring nothing into this world and we take nothing out of it. We who call Jesus Lord devote ourselves to resisting greed, which plunges the human heart into ruin and pierces it with many griefs. We're determined to practice generosity with free hearts, fixing our hope on God and not the uncertainty of wealth. We desire to be rich in good deeds and willing to share all that we have, laying up for ourselves treasure in heaven that will not decay, but will shine even in the age to come. Right now, you can give with us online through the PushPay app or at our website. Hello everybody, John Mark Comer here. Welcome to the teaching portion for Bridgetown Church Online. Please turn your Bibles to Exodus 13. We have just one more pastoral word for you before we kick off our spring practice on simplicity. Exodus 13. And Holy Spirit, come into every living room or apartment, into every family or marriage or single, into every body, into every soul. Come and speak, open our mind, and beyond that, our heart to your love. Amen. You are a college student, and you're just weeks away from your long-awaited graduation, and you have no idea if or when you will be able to get a job. Or you just lost your job, and you have no idea how long it will be until you come across another one or you're a small business owner and you just finished a remodel on your storefront and you have no idea if your business will even survive, 
or you're an entrepreneur and you have no idea if your dream will even make it off of the ground, or you're a grandparent and you have no idea how long it will be until you can have your grandchild over for a sleepover, plop them in your lap and make strawberry pancakes the next morning, or you're a church and you just spent the last two years giving to the point of sacrifice to restore a beautiful old church building right in the middle of the city, and it's days away from completion, and it's gorgeous, and you have no idea how long it will be until you can even show up in the space. That feeling in your body, that cocktail of fear and grief and confusion is uncertainty. And uncertainty is more than the sum of its parts. It's more than, it's not just uncertainty as in the absence of certainty, it's the presence of dread. And we Americans have a very low tolerance level for uncertainty. We grew up on a steady diet of charts and progress reports and projections. We're just not used to it at all. People who grew up in poverty or in a war zone like in Syria right now or in London in World War II or who experienced trauma as a child or are diagnosed with leukemia or cancer at a young age, all of them have at least the chance to make peace with uncertainty. But most of us, especially those of us that grew up in the middle middle class and or are a part of the majority culture, we're not used to it at all. We're used to feeling in control of our body and our life. We're used to planning for our future. We're used to a sense of linear progress and forward motion year over year. All of that went out the window seven weeks ago. There is just so much that we don't know right now. We don't even know what the death rate is yet for the coronavirus. We don't know how many people have been infected. We don't know what percentage of the population is asymptomatic and or has antibodies. We don't know if the virus will mutate and peter out or keep raging like a fire. We don't know what effect, if any, summer will have on the virus in the Northern Hemisphere. We don't know when a vaccine will be ready or how effective it is. We don't know if the economy will follow a U curve or a V, if we're heading into the next kind of great recession or worse, the next great depression, or if everything will come roaring back by the end of summer. We don't know what the long-term effects of social distancing are. Will it bring us back together with a new kind of post-Zoom value for embodiment and anti-digital distraction, or just drive our society further into individualism and isolationism? We don't know what the effect of the virus and the economic fallout and not being able to come together will have on our church. Will it make us stronger and more unified and more about the way, than, way of Jesus than ever before? Or will it injure us in some unforeseen way? We don't even know when we will be able to have full-scale gatherings again in our new building. And we don't know if this will last for weeks or months or years. Now, there are a lot of very smart people out there who are telling us this is how things will go, and one or two or three of them will be right. The problem is we don't know who. Politicians have an angle, pundits just want our attention, and the media is making millions right now off of fear-mongering. Even the best experts with no agenda just don't know how this will go. As one doctor said to me recently as we were debriefing like contradictory news reports, he said, it's all just educated conjecture. In psycho-spiritual language, it's a grasping for control. Psychologists differentiate between grief and trauma. The main difference is time. Grief is in the past, whereas trauma is ongoing and there's no end in sight, as well as intensity. Trauma is a whole other level of acute pain. And most psychologists categorize COVID-19 as a trauma for our generation. And the hallmark feeling of trauma is powerlessness, feeling like you have no control over your body or your life or your future. And what almost all people do, regardless of personality type, when they feel powerless is grasp for control. Here are a few very common examples that we read in the news every single day. Number one, blaming. Because if we can find a scapegoat to blame the entire thing on, be that China or President Trump or the liberal elites or the media or the right or the left, if we can find a scapegoat, then we can feel in control of the situation. 
or magical thinking, just take this pill or drink this thing, or it's not actually a real thing. Because again, if we can believe a fantasy, then we can feel in control of reality. Or prediction, this one is very common right now. What's going to happen is dot, 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 when in reality, that's one of many possibilities. Because if we can predict the future, then we can feel in control of the future and okay and safe. Or one I hear a lot right now is people saying, the world will never be the same. Maybe, likely, I don't know, maybe not. People said the same thing about, you know, 9-11, and in a sense that's true, but we still fly in airplanes. In fact, prior to this, more than ever before. Uh, a lot of people are saying the church will never be the same. The church will never come back to buildings or gatherings. It's house churches forever. Maybe that could happen. I doubt it. I don't know. After the Spanish flu a century ago, people came back to church buildings. And in fact, it was followed by the highest church attendance in American history, and not that many years after by the rise of the megachurch movement. We just don't know. To say the world will never be the same or the church will never be the same is yet another chasing after the wind that is control. And then there are the far more common everyday examples from just life, reading the news 10, 12 times a day. Because again, if we can know the future, we can feel in control of the future. Or obsessive behavior at the top of the list right now is dieting and exercise or cleaning or organizing your closet. Because if we don't feel in control, let me control my diet or my body or my workout routine or my closet or my clothing or my stuff or just being super tyrannical with your kids or uptight with your spouse or roommate. The common denominator in all of these examples is a futile attempt to control something that is far beyond our control. We can't control the coronavirus. Influence it, sure, a bit, can't control it. We can't control politics. We can't control the nation state. We can't control the global economy. We can't control the future. But what if that's okay? In fact, what if the uncertainty of life with the coronavirus could be one of the best things to ever happen to our spiritual formation? I hypothesize that control is the issue underneath so many of the issues that block and hamper and derail our spiritual formation into people of love and joy and peace. For sure, it is the growth edge for my personality type and my personal spiritual journey. But with each passing year in my work as a pastor and teacher, I am more and more of the conviction that it is the issue underneath the issues for most people, not just me. Remember the three theological virtues from a few weeks ago, faith, hope, and love? We called them in the language of church history, theological virtues. One, because they are theological, they had to do with God, don't make sense without God. And two, they are virtues, not just feelings that come and go, but the kind of people we become as we apprentice under Jesus. Control is incompatible with all three, faith, Controlling people do not live with a deep trust and steady confidence in God's goodness and involvement over their life. Rather, they are anxious and uptight and on edge. Hope, we define hope as the expectation of coming good based on the person and promises of God. Controlling people are not full of hope for God's future, but rather live in a vicious cycle of planning for their future, followed often by disappointment when their plans go belly up. And love, above all, controlling people are not loving. They, and by they I mean yours truly, I dominate and manipulate and bully other people to get them to behave the way I think they need to behave in order for me to feel okay. Rather than love and accept and delight in people as they are and honor the dignity of their free will and accept life as it actually comes to us. This is very hard for me. I'm teaching to you out of weakness, not out of strength this weekend. I am what you would call a recovering control freak slash control freak under conviction of the spirit. If you're familiar with Myers-Briggs, I'm a very high J in that theory. I'm the consummate perfectionist. I don't have OCD, but to quote my doctor, I have obsessive tendencies. I'm a diehard planner. I literally, planning is my idea of a good time. I literally sit down the night before a day off and plan it out hour by hour. Is that all bad? 
No, not at all. In fact, some of it is, is good and is mature. A modicum of discipline is a very good thing, and a lot of us need to grow in it. I do in other areas. But discipline, in particular for a personality type like mine, can actually hamper our growth into people of faith, hope, and love because it's easy for discipline to become another form of control over our morning routine or our schedule or our diet or our body or whatever it is. And again, that's not all bad. Some of that is you know, synonymous with maturity, but it's easy to then slip over into the fantasy that we are in control of our life as a whole when in reality we're not. As I've said before, all of the data, secular scientific data basically says, and this is for Western kind of people, that we have about 15% of the control over our life, over what does or does not happen that we think we do. That's why the world is full of so much anger and hurt and blame shifting and apprehension and depression and disappointment and so little faith and hope and love. I am not the only one Control is the base problem for so many of us. So, here's my question. Is there another way to deal with the uncertainty of life besides a grasping for control? And to come out the other side of a global pandemic, whether it's months from now or whenever, with a new reservoir to tap into in our soul of faith and hope and love? The answer is, of course, yes. And the best paradigm I can think of in Scripture is the story of Israel in the desert, Exodus 13. The spirits had me reading and rereading Exodus over and over again over the last month since it all kicked off. Take a look at the opening story of Israel in the desert, chapter 13, verse 17. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. For God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. They're not ready. So God led the people around, or by a circular route, by the desert road toward the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of Egypt ready for battle. Notice a few things. First, notice that God does not take them from Egypt to Canaan by a direct route. Instead, he takes them by a roundabout way through the desert. The main road, called the Via Maris, went straight north through Philistine territory. But God takes them southeast, literally in the wrong direction, along the Suez Canal out to the desert of Mount Sinai. They thought they were ready for the next. The Israelites went up out of Egypt, quote, ready for battle, but they were not actually ready. So God takes them into the desert for two things, testing and teaching. In the Exodus narrative, there are 10 commandments and then 10 tests for Israel to see if she's ready for new life in Canaan. And all but a few, Joshua and Caleb, fail all 10 tests. It's a resounding no, she's not ready. Which is why next comes the Torah, a Hebrew word meaning teaching, to show Israel, to teach Israel how to live in a new kind of freedom and move forward. And it takes time for the testing and teaching to take effect. Scholars argue the direct route north was an 11 day journey by foot in the ancient world. But God takes them into the desert for, depending on how you do the math, two years. It ends up being 40 years due to Israel's choice to not follow Joshua over the Jordan River. But in a hypothetical scenario where that never happened, there was no 40 years in the desert, God still had them make an 11-day journey in around two years. Because I, I think that the hidden insight there is that journey is more important than destination in spirituality. Put another way, who we are is more important than where we are. Keep reading, verse 20. After leaving Sukkoth, they camped at Itham on the edge of the desert. By day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so that they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front, not behind, not to the side, in front of the people. Notice, second, that God does not give Israel a map and a schedule. Instead, he gives them his presence as a guide. 
um, a little bit, a few times a year, um, as my part of my work outside of Bridgetown, I get to travel around the world. And once in a while, I get to go some really cool places like Iceland or New Zealand or Australia. And whenever possible, I schedule in a day or two kind of a vacation time to just see the world with my son who's with me or whatever. And if it's just us, we have our phone and our T-Mobile plan that is international for cheap, and we put in maps like how to go to a tourist destination, whatever. But the best is when we have a guide. Um, some of the best memories of my life and, and my time with my son have been driving around Iceland with Helgi or through the Scottish Highlands with Jim or around New Zealand with Dan and Strawn and just these around Melbourne with Mark, just these wonderful souls who function as a guide. They pick me up at a set time. I literally don't know where we're going. I don't know how long we're out. I don't know what's along the way, but it is the most fun. You just relax, you hear with these intelligent people who know all sorts of things. We have this incredible experience in Iceland where the pastor of the church I was speaking for was a part-time tour guide. And so he took me out through this like canyon that was named after Thor and a super Jeep through like all of these rivers and up these, and we're learning about North mythology and Christian spirituality and Celtic history. And it's just, it was a life-giving experience. But the interesting thing about a guide is you're not in control, you don't know where you're going, and you don't know how long it will take. A map, you feel in control. You go from point A to point B in set amount of time, unless if you hit traffic or whatever. A guide, though, is a whole other experience. It's a much better experience, but it's a whole other kind of experience. In the same way, God does not give them a map and a schedule, but himself as a guide. One more, turn the page to chapter 16. Israel goes through the Red Sea, and then on the other side, we read chapter 16, verse one. The whole Israelite community set out from Elim and came to the desert of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai on the 15th day of the second month after they have come out of Egypt. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. Interesting, two and a half months into the desert and they are, they are not feeling the love at that point. They start to get a little angsty, sound familiar at all. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt, that's a bit melodramatic, there we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted, not true at all, but you have brought us out into the desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Not true at all, that's the illusion of nostalgia and you know, assuming evil intent, all of it. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down fire from heaven and kill you. No, not at all. I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough just for that day. In this way, I will test them. There's one of the 10 tests and see whether they will follow my instructions or not. On the sixth day, they are to prepare what they bring in. And that is to be twice as much as they gather on the other days for the Sabbath. Skip down to nine. Then Moses told Aaron, say to the entire Israelite community, come before the Lord, he's heard your grumbling. While Aaron was speaking to the whole Israelite community, they looked toward the desert and there was the glory of the Lord appearing in the cloud or God's presence. The Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the Israelites. Tell them at twilight you will eat meat and in the morning you will be filled with bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. That evening, quail came and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the dew was gone, thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, what is it? Or in Hebrew, that sounds like manna, for they did not know what it was. Last, notice that God does not give them a farm or a grocery store or a supply chain or Amazon Prime, but manna just enough bread for one day at a time, what Jesus later in the Sermon on the Mount called daily bread. Now, in the story, there are three invitations from God to Israel in the desert. One was to camp around his presence and trust him to lead and guide them through the desert and into Canaan. Two was to live gratefully one day at a time on the manna, and three was to let his testing and his teaching form them into people who were ready for the next chapter of their story. 
Instead, what happened? One, they did not trust and follow him at all. Instead, they refused to follow his presence and direction over the Jordan River because there were, quote, giants in the land. Two, they did not live gratefully at all, but instead grumble over and over and over again. It's like the same lame story on repeat. And they attempt to hoard the manna overnight, and it's a disaster. And three, they did not let his testing and his Torah form them. Instead, in the language of the narrator, they were a stiff-necked people, meaning they were stubborn, the opposite of open and pliable and clay in the hands of the potter. And I wonder, is there anything that we can learn from Israel's sojourn in the desert? After all, the desert was a time of transition from Egypt to Canaan and a time of great uncertainty. Where are we going? How long will it take? What will happen? What is the danger level or threat or not? We said early on that the stay home order is a kind of involuntary desert. There's a stripping away right now, not just for followers of Jesus, of the hedonism of our city. And right now at an emotional level and a spiritual level, we're bare and we're exposed and we're open to whatever is next. But more than that, it's a time of transition from a pre-COVID world to a post-COVID world, I say that in faith. And it's a time of great uncertainty. My fellow pastor Bethany in her recent teaching series on transitions called it the neutral zone. It's what developmental psychologists call liminal space where you are between one phase of development and another. It's what our friend Pete Scazzaro calls the confusing in between. I love that, the confusing in between. Whatever you call the current situation, Pete's claim, if you're familiar with his work, is that the confusing in between, as he calls it, almost always takes longer than we expect and is harder than we want. But all of the experts agree, the confusing in between with all of its uncertainty is where God does some of his best work. I'm thinking of the coming year as our year in the desert. I don't know if it will be a year, I have no idea. It could be two more months, it could be two years. We have, again, we don't know. But I'm thinking of the coming season in the life of our church as kind of our, our experience of liminal space, our kind of experience of the confusing in between. I, for one, would rather just take the direct route north. 11 days sounds great. Let's just move into our new building, go from good to even better, finish practicing the way. We have all sorts of staffing ideas for the year ahead, all sorts of dreams for 2021 and what's next after practicing the way. It all sounds great to me and all of it, all of that momentum that we were in has ground to a halt. We literally can't even gather with our communities in person right now and break the bread of Jesus and drink the wine of Jesus. Not even that yet, hopefully in a few weeks, but not yet. All of it's just ground to a stop. Instead, here we are waiting at home. And there are three invitations to us now as there were to Israel then. One is to camp around God's presence and trust Him to lead and guide us through the coming season into whatever is next. Put another way, to ground ourselves in God and His peace. As Jesus put it, to abide in the vine, which can be translated to make our home in God and let God make His home in us. We do this through our rule of life and practices or spiritual disciplines like morning prayer and scripture reading and Sabbath, all of which are a means to the end of what A.W. Tozer called living in constant conscious communion. What a trellis is to a vine, a rule of life or practices from the way of Jesus are to our abiding in God and his love. And as we make our home in God and his love, we sit there and we wait in the quiet on his direction over our life and for our church and our world. Experts on transitions see liminal space as a rite of passage in a traditional culture, say from boyhood to manhood, and argue that you need a guide for liminal space or you get lost in it. And the beautiful but terrifying reality of free will is we all get to choose our guide. B. 
be it God or our news outlet of choice or our political party or just that anxious voice in the back of our head or our dad or our mom or our friend or our roommate. The invite, the invitation is to choose God as our guide in the coming months. Second, it's to live gratefully one day at a time. Not to over-spiritualize it as a danger there, but to live off of God's manna, meaning to live off of a prophetic word from God over our life or our church or a promise from Scripture and just His literal provision over our life, food for that day, a roof over our head for that night. It's funny how often, you know, maybe this is just me, but I don't think so, we vow to give God our future, often with like a wave of emotion and kind of a sense of hero heroism in our heart. But the future is easy to give God for the simple fact that we don't have it. Easy to give something that you don't have. All we have to give God is today the present moment with all of its good food, provision, we're still alive, we're still breathing, and all of its pain and suffering, we're sick or we're out of work or we're sad or we're dealing with disappointment or doubt, whatever the present is, that's all that we have to give to God is right here, right now, how we live today. We must fight off the urge to grumble, which right now is louder in my heart than ever before, and instead, live from a place of gratitude for our daily bread, literal and figurative. In the language of the serenity prayer, living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as the pathway to peace. And finally, three, to let God form us into people who are ready for whatever is next, for our church, for our city and our world, for our life and our soul. It's to open up to God and cooperate with His work in our soul, not close off or resist Him or anesthetize the pain, but let God cut deep like the, like the physician, like the surgeon of the soul that God is to bring about our healing and our health and our life. And the only way to do this is to live in what the mystics have called holy uncertainty. I love that language, holy uncertainty. Holy uncertainty is the capacity to live with a very loose grip or no grip at all on our plans and more importantly, on the outcome of our plans. Because our security, that emotional sense, is based in abiding in a relational connection to the living God, not in a sense of control. Apprentices of Jesus who develop his capacity for holy uncertainty still make plans and all of that, but they are free at an emotional level from the need for those plans to come to pass. They don't need to know what will happen or will not happen or how long it will all take because they are happy and content in God. The mystics argue that holy uncertainty is one of the reasons that God takes so many through the dark night of the soul in the language of St. John of the Cross, through a desert-like season of dry, arid spirituality where there's a stripping down of our emotional enjoyment of God, not in cruelty, but in love. In the dark night, it's all of it is to set us free from our fear-based need for control. In the dark night, we realize that we're not in control of our relationship with God. God is. That Christian spirituality is not a formula or a self-improvement plan in the name of Jesus or a religion in the negative sense of that word. It is a relationship of rescue. And God is in charge of that relationship. He's the initiator and he is 100% in charge of the rescue. All we can do is say yes and yield. I said a few weeks ago that two-thirds of the Psalms are lament. The Psalms that we come back to over and over again and pray in the dark night are the many of them that don't resolve at the end. You know, some of the Psalms end with things were really bad, but it all worked out. God, thank you. We praise you. But a lot of them end with things are really bad. And God, where the heck are you? As Jesus said on the cross from Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Where are you? Where is your hand in my life? But I trust you that you are good and you are near even if I can't see your hand and I'm okay. If we can get there, 
if we can make peace with the inevitable uncertainty of life, then we can live with serenity right in the middle of the desert or the confusing in between. It's interesting to me that if you keep reading Exodus 16, go read it on your own time. After the manna story comes the introduction of Sabbath to Israel. It's a literary way of saying that we can, that if we can live one day at a time in just gratitude and trust in God, we can not only survive in the desert of uncertainty, but actually come to thrive in it with an entire day set aside just to smile in delight at our life before God. All that to say, we have an incredible opportunity with COVID-19. It's said that the World War II generation, after living through a global disaster, was the most relaxed and happy generation in American history. Happiness levels peaked in America in the decade after the war, been in decline since 1952. And experts argue that millennials and Jay-Z, my generation and that of my kids, who grew up with more security than any other generation in American history, are the most anxious generation of all time. As Shakespeare put it, security is mortal's chiefest enemy. And while staying home for a few months or whatever this turns out to be is not World War II, still, there is an opportunity here that most generations don't get until later in life, if at all. As I said, some people get to holy uncertainty at a very young age due to war or poverty or trauma or cancer or something like that. But most people don't even receive an invitation until the second half of life, which is when most of us have to face reality. The reality of an aging body, the reality of our own mortality, the reality of mistakes that we've made in our past, that some things break beyond repair, that life is not an upward climb of more and more money and success or whatever it is, that we're not God, that we have limits. If you were here last spring for our practice on naming your stage of apprenticeship, we covered stage theory, which is basically a fusion of developmental psychology and Christian spirituality. We spent time on the first and second half of life paradigm, and we basically said that the second half of life is less linear, less about upward mobility, less about external success, more about the inward journey, less about kind of grasping for control, and more about surrender and acceptance and joy. And we had Morris Dirks, who is a spiritual director and former pastor, come and teach on spirituality in the second half of life. He used this diagram and he said, you know, when we're young, we have this sense of upward mobility and forward motion. We think that the sky is the limit, but then at some point we all hit what he called a crisis of limitation. We're fired from a job that we love or our career is on a plateau or we go through a divorce or a problem with our child or the death of a loved one or it could be any number of things. When that happens, the crisis of limitation, which for most people is in middle age, there are three trajectories for the soul. Number one is what he called the old fool. We just keep living in the fantasy of upward mobility. In the 80s, you know, it was the stereotype of the wannabe Magnum PI guy with the mustache and the, you know, chest hair and the gold medallion and the Porsche with the convertible or whatever. But far more people, number two, become the embittered fool, in particular in our city. They just settle, watch Netflix, drink a little bit too much, criticize, write off a nasty email, become a cynic. But a few people, a precious few, become, number three, a holy fool. They accept the invitation to go on the inward journey, to define or really redefine the metrics of success, to discover or really rediscover what life is actually all about. And in Jesus' language, as he put it in, I love Eugene Peterson's translation of Matthew 11, they live freely and lightly, freely and lightly. I say that because right now, our entire generation is receiving the invitation to go on the inner journey now. As a 19-year-old college student who had to move back home with your parents and give up your dream of grad school in this formula, as a 30-something business owner who's watching it all crumble, as a 20-something or 40-something couple who's, who's dealing with the reality of your marriage right now, as a 39-year-old pastor 
who is cooped up with your family as an introvert under a lot of pressure and is more aware now than ever of some of the ways that your body, that your soul is hurting, causing injury to your wife and your firstborn son, and that if it doesn't change in the near future, it will cause permanent damage. And you're living with that and watching that day after day. All of us are receiving an invitation. So much of growth into maturity is about receiving invitations with a resounding yes. As Ronald Roheiser put it in Sacred Fire, one of my favorite books of all time on the second half of life, everybody over 35 should read this book. He writes, we mature by meeting life just as God and nature designed it and accepting there the invitations that beckon us ever deeper into the heart of life itself. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity to accept the invitation of Jesus himself into holy uncertainty, to go out into the desert, into the liminal space that we're about to enter into or we're already in right now, and to let God form us and set us free to become people of faith and hope and love. Now to end, this does not mean that we don't make plans, like don't misread me at all. If you know me, I'm responsible to a fault, right? Not saying that. It just means that we make our plans, but then we take a deep breath and we, at an emotional level, let go of outcomes. We strategize and do all the stuff and go to the meetings and do our best to live well, but then we make peace with the fact that we're not in control of what happens and that's okay. Our elders and staff right now are in the middle of scenario planning for whatever comes after the stay home order. We literally have half a dozen scenarios right now. Um, I'm, my guess is that number will double in a few weeks that we're planning for. Here's what we do if we can gather of groups of no more than 10 or no more than seven or no more than 50 or no more than 100. Or here's what we do if you know this lasts for a few months for the summer or until next summer. Or here's what we do if it's a great recession and and our giving goes down by this percentage or that percentage, or here's what we do if our giving doesn't go down at all. Here's what we do if this goes down or this goes down. And none of it is an attempt at control. It's just an attempt to lead and pastor in a way that is responsive but not reactive. As Eisenhower said after World War II, quote, in preparing for battle, I have always found that plans are useless, but planning is indispensable. I read Ike's biography years ago, but it was somebody on our board of directors, Sonny Grover, thank you, buddy, who uh, sent that to me in a text, and I thought that is like my motto for life right now. Plans are useless, planning is indispensable. But when we finish all of our scenario planning in a week or two, our plan is then just to close our Evernote file, chuckle, like sometimes the best way to deal with suffering is just to laugh a little bit, take a deep breath, and then go have dinner. We don't know if any of it will even happen at all. As James put it, now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. That's from James 4. So make your plans for the summer and the fall and 2021 and 2022, go for it. But then set them down, have a little chuckle, detach from outcomes, tether yourself to God's presence and his peace. Go have dinner with your family or take a walk with your friend, live one day at a time and give thanks. So, what is ahead for Bridgetown Church? The honest answer, we don't know. And that's okay. Our plan is to start the simplicity practice next Sunday because that's what we do as a church, practice the way of Jesus together in Portland. As soon as Governor Brown lifts the stay home order and we get the go ahead from the doctors, our plan is to go right back to house churches and function like a house church network whether that's for two weeks or two months, we have no idea. 
And then, you know, as soon as we are able, and it's all above bar, our hope is to kind of go back to our new building and start praying there. We're thinking that at least by the summer, we will, we will be able to have smaller gatherings, 50 or 100, I think 100 people with social distancing or without, depends who we talk to. Um, thankfully, our building is large enough that even if we have to do it with social distancing, as lame as that is, we can do it. And we'll keep the online church going until there is a vaccine, until everybody can come back together again. As the number of people with immunity grows, our hope is that more and more people can come on a Sunday and gather in person and as soon as possible without social distancing and all of that. And in the meantime, myself and our pastoral team will do our very best to pastor you over the digital space and care for all of you who, for any number of reasons, are, um, are not ready yet to come back to our gatherings. And then when this is all over, our plan is to throw a party like you would not believe. But that's just the plan. Will it go that way? I have no idea. I hope so, and I hope it goes that way fast. I have no idea. That could be bad leadership on our part, but I don't think so. A lot of pastors take their leadership cues from CEOs in the business world, and that's not all bad at all. Um, I prefer to take mine from doctors and therapists and spiritual directors. And my therapist recently said to me that if you experience cancer, the best type of doctor to have is not necessarily the smartest one who makes the most predictions. It's the doctor who's humble and honest and says, here's a few different ways it could go. You could live this long or this long, but in all honesty, I don't know. But I'm with you. You're not alone. And I think the same could be said for pastors and for all of us. Three of the most liberating words we can say to each other right now are, we don't know. And that's okay, because God is with us. We're not alone. We are together as a church in the way of Jesus in holy uncertainty. To close, if you're just really feeling this right now, we have our pastors and our prayer team standing by to initiate a call with you and pray with you over Zoom. All you need to do is there's a little request prayer button right there in your browser. Just click on that and wait a few minutes for somebody to pray over you, listen to God with you, prophesy over your life, whatever comes to pass, comes to pass. And now, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Come and make your home in us. We ask you to increase our capacity to live with holy uncertainty. Set us free from the attachments that hold us down at an emotional level. And would you reattach our heart to you and your presence and your peace. And will we come out of the other side of this, whenever that is, weeks or months or who knows when, God, will we come out more people and more of a church of faith and hope and love than ever before. Let's sing together. Yeah, Lord, we praise you today. God, we thank you for who you are. God, we honor you today, Lord, in this place, Lord, in our homes, with our families, with our friends, God. We honor you. Lord, we magnify your name. We thank you for who you are, Lord. We thank you for what you've done for us. We thank you, Lord, that you're in control of every circumstance, of every situation. Lord, we fix our eyes on you. Thank you, Jesus. We love you. Thanks so much for gathering with us online. We love you, we miss you, we are praying for you. Make sure that you either follow us on social media or just sign up for our weekly and watch our weekly update video. It comes out every Thursday. We're doing more than ever right now as a church justice in the city. We're praying together pretty much every single day, all day on Tuesdays, communities over Zoom or whatever in the virtual space. And we would love for you to be more part of our church now than ever before. I can not wait until I see you at least from six feet away and wave and in time give you a hug. Love to all of you and peace from Jesus, from the Father, and from the Spirit.